Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Apple's Mac Pro desktop from 2013 certainly caught a lot of attention with its bold new design, but also for its technical limitations. The landscape for high-performance computing has changed dramatically since its launch, though, so let's see where, or if, the so-called trash can Mac still fits in. Prices for used 2013 Mac Pros started falling dramatically, and I decided it was finally time to pick one up to check out for myself. When new, these machines had a starting price of $3,000 US, but the base model I bought cost me only a tenth of that. It arrived in overall good condition, with just a few small scratches from normal wear. The machine booted to a fresh installation of macOS 10 Yosemite, but I updated it to macOS Monterey, the latest it would support. Sure enough, this was the base spec model with a quad-core Intel Xeon E5 1650v2 processor, 16GB of RAM, dual AMD Fire Pro D300 GPUs, and a 256GB SSD. I wanted to get some performance benchmarks, so I fired up Geekbench 5 and ran its CPU tests, yielding scores of 871 for a single core and 3514 for all of them. But that only tells part of the story, so I ran the machine through a 10-minute Cinebench R23 loop where it scored 3763, which placed it at the bottom of the list. SSD performance was also a curiosity, and the Blackmagic Disk Speed Test app showed figures of about 750 megabytes per second on writes and 950 megabytes on reads. In 2013, these numbers may have been compelling, but they aren't so much anymore. Thankfully, though, there's ample opportunity for improvement. A box turned up shortly after I received the Mac Pro. Inside were some parts that I hoped would give the machine a chance at competing with some modern systems, and they came from a seller that specializes in refurbished server components. I went this route not just to save some money, but also because parts of this vintage aren't really being made anymore. The package contains some more RAM, specifically DDR3 14900R in the form of 16 gigabyte sticks. The Mac Pro supports quad-channel memory, so naturally, I bought four of them, and this would take the machine up to its official maximum of 64 gigabytes. The bigger upgrade would be the replacement CPU I picked up, a Xeon E5 2697V2, which boasts 12 cores. Apple sold the Mac Pro with several CPU options, and this was the highest-end one you could get. I didn't forget about storage, either. Like many of Apple's computers from this era, the Mac Pro came with a modular but proprietary SSD. While some third-party solutions have been made, they're overly expensive compared to a normal drive. Thankfully, just the connector is custom. The computer can take normal M.2 drives with the use of an adapter. A variety of drives have been found to be compatible, and I went with a used 1TB Intel 660p. Its lack of an anti-static bag was concerning, but overall I'm not too worried about used SSDs, as I've found that wear is usually much less of a problem than people tend to believe. So with all my parts ready to go, it simply came down to a matter of getting them installed.
Working on this model of Mac Pro is definitely more complicated than the typical PC, but not as bad as I was anticipating, since nothing is really miniaturized like in a laptop. It is necessary to pretty much disassemble the entire computer to swap the CPU though, and that plays a key factor in why this model was nowhere near as popular as its predecessor. We'll get to that in a bit. The vendor I got the CPU from thoughtfully included some thermal paste, but I opted to go with my own. A few of the standoffs had come off with the CPU bracket instead of staying on the heatsink, but I got them put back where they belonged, and reassembly was fairly straightforward. Swapping the CPU is by far the hardest part. The SSD upgrade only entailed removing a single screw to free the old drive. I snapped the adapter onto the new NVMe drive, and it fit perfectly in the machine. The RAM was even easier, just press the latch and the old modules slide right out. I was able to boot the machine off of a USB flash drive and the new SSD showed up and formatted without a problem. And after getting the OS installed, Geekbench reported the new CPU and RAM properly too. The upgrades were a success. But did they make much of a difference? I reran the same benchmarks from before to find out. With the new 12-core processor, the single-core performance actually went down a bit, but the multi-core went way up, a bit over double that of the original. This is due to clock speed differences between the two chips. The original quad-core CPU has a base clock of 3.7 GHz and can turbo boost up to 3.9, whereas the 12-core is 2.7 GHz and turbos to 3.5 but both chips have the same TDP of 130 watts, so the new one will likely have to throttle back sooner to stay within its limits. Testing the new SSD yielded a solid improvement, 1100 megabytes per second for writes and 1300 for reads, up about 350 from the original drive. The Cinebench test saw similar CPU results to that of Geekbench, 8195 versus 3763 from before. There was another score that caught my eye though, an identical E5 2697 that was about 200 points higher, and it explains another of the Mac Pro's major limitations. In order for Apple's engineers to design a cylindrical computer, they split the components across several sections. The motherboard and both video cards share the same triangular-shaped heatsink, which yields severe performance limitations, especially with just one fan at the top to draw air through the machine. Apple made a big deal about this design when the machine was launched, with executive Phil Schiller dropping a now infamous quote. Can't innovate anymore, my ass. <laughs> And while the Mac Pro got a lot of attention from the press for its design, the professional users who it was marketed towards were furious. The previous so-called cheese grater Mac Pros were easily serviceable and highly upgradable, with multiple internal drive bays, PCIe slots, and dual CPU sockets. Apple expected any expansion or upgrades to happen externally with the 2013 model, hence the presence of half a dozen Thunderbolt ports but it was a tough sell to an audience that cared more about how well the computer worked than how it looked. Another blunder came in the form of the video cards. The 2013 model came with two discrete GPUs from AMD. FirePro D300s with 2GB of memory each in the base model, the mid-range D500s with 3GB, and the high-end D700s with 6GB. But not only were they proprietary and thus not really upgradable, they also bet on a future that never happened. Multi-GPU support in professional applications. The industry simply preferred to scale single GPUs up in performance instead. Their trash can nickname became apt in more ways than one. Not just a reference to their appearance, but also to their relative performance. Some Pro users decided to simply stick with their prior machines, upgrading them as much as they could, while others turned to the Hackintosh scene, building a PC exactly how they wanted, then installing the macOS on it. 
And uncharacteristically, Apple owned up to its mistake. A few executives met with a group of journalists in 2017 to admit the machine's faults, with Schiller saying that the thermal constraints severely limited their options, which also explained why the machine saw zero upgrades in its four years on the market at that point. This came at a time when many were wondering if Apple even cared about the high-end market at all anymore. And what skeptics got was a promise that the company was working on a new machine that would right all the wrongs. In 2019, a new Mac Pro was launched, which returned to the boxy tower format that many wanted, but still had a few caveats. While it offered PCIe slots again, it still only had a single CPU socket, and no bays for hard drives. The biggest problem was its price, starting at $6,000 US. And that didn't even include the optional and somewhat ridiculous wheels for the bottom, which sold for an extra 400 bucks. But I was curious though how the 2013 Mac Pro compared to a modern Mac. As it turns out, surprisingly well. I ran the same suite of benchmarks on my MacBook Pro from 2020, which has an Apple M1 chip and 16 gigabytes of RAM. The single-core Geekbench score was far better on the laptop, but the multi-core results were almost identical. My upgraded Mac Pro actually scored a few hundred points higher in Cinebench, though it came nowhere close to the MacBook's SSD speeds. The GPU benchmarks, though, weren't what I expected. Using the metal test in Geekbench, just one of the Mac Pro's D300 cards edged out the M1 and the graphics in Apple Silicon chips are no joke. Does that mean one of these almost decade-old desktops could be a good deal? On paper, yes, actually. Including the cost of all the upgrade parts, I paid less than $500 for this maxed out Mac Pro. The cheapest new Mac that gives equivalent performance is an M1 Mac Mini, scoring just about the same as the MacBook Pro that I tested. A refurbished one of those sells for about $600, but that only includes 8GB of RAM and 256GB of storage. Bump the memory up to its 16GB maximum and move up to 1TB of storage, and you'd spend over twice as much. There are some practical concerns, however. First, you'd need to do like I did and upgrade a base model Mac Pro yourself. The parts are remarkably cheap, but the actual work isn't really suited for beginners. You'll also end up with a machine that draws more power and runs hotter than the Mac Mini, which may or may not be a concern for you. But the biggest limiting factor is that Apple stopped supporting the 2013 Pro past macOS Monterey. Sure, you could keep using it for a while longer, and a few might turn to the software hacking community to shoehorn on newer versions, but it's clear that the machine's days are numbered. Still though, it's an interesting option. There's no denying that the Mac Pro has a distinctive look and that you can upgrade one to a modern level of performance so inexpensively is fairly compelling. But if you expect something that can last you the next several years, it's probably best to look elsewhere. Otherwise, for mainstream use cases, one of these could be worth considering, provided you can live with the limitations. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.